Uh, welcome everyone. So uh, here is uh, yet another uh, webinar session. So we do this knowledge sharing uh, across different platforms and like we have online sessions, face-to-face -face sessions and webinar is one of the platforms that we use at the Institute of Product Leadership. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you all to this session. I am Menaka and I have with me my colleagues uh, Bipin and uh, Kethan to make this session uh, flow smooth. <clears throat> so uh, some of you have been with us for a long time, you have been attending our knowledge sharing session and you already know about the institute. But for the benefit of the new joinings, let me give you a very quick update or uh, uh, intro to the Institute of Product Leadership. So we were founded in the year 2012. Uh, we, are, we are into executive education. <clears throat> so we do uh, higher education in product leadership, data science, and other new age technology. Uh, we have 800 plus uh, alumni. And uh, as you can see here, we, have, uh, we are spread across various campuses in India and abroad. In Bangalore, uh, we are, our campus is in the CMR University where we conduct our flagship program, the Executive MBA. So um, we, uh, one of the panelists, could you please put yourself on the mute for now? Uh, sorry, so um, our programs, uh, we have programs you know, um, across different categories. So as I told you, the, our flagship program, the Executive MBA in product leadership, it, it's an 18 month program. And uh, we have various uh, skill boot camps and uh, three day sessions or even half a day skillathons. We have a lot of interesting programs and activities going on. Uh, IPL, is, or IPL or the Institute of Product Leadership, it's always buzzing with activity. Please have a look at our website. <clears throat> So uh, we, we do uh, work with a lot of uh, corporates also. So we do uh, skill gap analysis for corporates. We do co corporate training in uh, product leadership, product management, project management, product marketing, data science, et cetera. So these are some of our very happy clients. One of the very important uh, sessions that we host is the coaching session uh, on, the, on the career. So uh, there are um, most of you or many of you, you know, would have this question about where your career is going. Uh, if, you, if you're already into product management, like how can I take it a step ahead? Uh, what kind of technology should I learn? or what kind of changes should I make in my profile to attain that perfect job which I'm looking for? Like you will have a hundred different questions in your mind. So one very good way of sorting it out is, please, uh, you can see this QR code on your uh, screen, please scan it and you can get a 30 minutes coaching session with the senior faculty. You can ask any of your questions, you can get all your uh, doubts clarified. We have uh, some very interesting uh, uh, webinars which we have scheduled for you know the next month uh, and some for the end of this month. So one is on the 26th of March. Uh, so uh, you can in your chat window you can see the uh, URL where you can go and register yourself for this webinar. So it's by Jessica Mari. Uh, she is the director of product marketing of Vera Securities. So she's going to talk about uh, the growing role of product marketing, like what she looks for when she wants to hire one. So it's, a, it's going to be a very interesting session. Please uh, register yourself. <clears throat> Our webinars happen on every Tuesdays. Uh, another webinar uh, which we have on the 30th of April, uh, it's five uh, reasons why product marketing as a career is hot. And you know what, Deepa Kumar, the VP of marketing in the Linux Foundation looks for when she hires. So th these are going to be very career oriented uh, sessions where you can ask a lot of career oriented questions. So please see your chat window where you can find the URL. Please go and register yourself there. 
<clears throat> Let me give you a quick uh, idea about how we conduct the webinar sessions. Um, so, um, see, if our webinars are conducted on every Tuesday, 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. IST. And uh, for the first 45 minutes, the speaker would uh, uh, share his views and <clears throat> the rest, the 15 minutes, uh, you, are, you can ask questions to the speaker. And there are multiple ways through which you can ask questions. One is you can tweet your questions. How to tweet? You can see on your chat window. And or you can post it in our uh, LinkedIn post. You can discuss your questions in the LinkedIn post. Uh, where uh, I would say the LinkedIn is a very good medium because you can interact with a lot of peers also. You can maybe argue on a particular topic or anything. So please go ahead and check our LinkedIn post also. Uh, you can see it in the chat window. Or you can email us your questions. Okay. <clears throat> and But the best way to ask your questions, I would say, is uh, to post your question in the Q&A window. Uh, so uh, many a times, uh, you know, even if we say to post the questions on the Q&A window, uh, we see that you post it in your chat window. Please do not do that because we will miss out on the questions. In the chat window, there are a lot of people chatting and we might miss out on the questions. So if you have a question, please post it only on the Q&A window of the Zoom. Please keep that in mind. And the best question, whoever asks the best question, the winner is picked by the speaker. And uh, the book that you see here, The Universal Principles of Design, is, is your gift. The best question wins this particular book. So the speaker will, um, uh, as, as the speaker is speaking, if the question comes into your mind, please go ahead and paste it in the Q&A window. We will take care of it. Today's webinar, we have a slight difference. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, I will just let you figure out what the difference is. <clears throat> so, as I was putting together these slides, uh, when it came to the speaker and his designations, uh, I was at a loss how to, how to introduce this wonderful person. Uh, so I, so, um, so he, he's a very interesting one. Today's speaker is a very interesting one. And it's not really easy to describe what he is. Okay, and uh, uh, if you want me, I can read out a whole paragraph from his LinkedIn or any other place that I can find about him. But that doesn't do justice to this particular person. I would like to say a few words about Liam Bhushan, our uh, speaker for the day, based on my personal interaction with him. He's a very rare individual. He lives life to the fullest. Uh, he, he's, um, you know, he speaks from his heart and on almost any topic you ask him, he can speak from his heart and uh, most of the times he doesn't use any deck or slides in his presentations. <clears throat> A highly versatile person, excuse me, <clears throat> I'm sorry. A highly versatile person, um, he's a multidisciplinary creative professional with 33 plus years of diverse experience uh, in design thinking. So his vision is to transform India into a superpower of design world, not just the design world. I'm sure that he would love it if every Indian thinks a little different and you know, well suited for the 21st century. Uh, I would like to call him water or a shape shifter. You, I'm sure you have uh, heard about the shape shifters, not in a wrong way, but uh, this is a person who can talk to any kind of a crowd, any kind of gathering on any topic. And for that particular reason, I don't want to put Mr. Niambushan on any particular bracket. I think you will figure out for yourself the caliber of this person. Niam, I'm very, very happy to have uh, known you, very happy to work with you. A very warm welcome to this session. And uh, you can take over from now. Um, thank you, Minika, for those glowing words. Um, and uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thanks, Bitten and Ketan, for being panelists and helping us out. 
And I see 32 participants here. I need eight more and I'll have my Alibaba and 40 Thieves. And we are ready to rock and roll with product design from India. Uh, the first thing I wish to say to everybody in this August gathering in the month of March is good morning. Now, of course, you would find that greeting odd because if you last checked your clock, it's exactly 9.14 p.m. However, as those of you who know me here would probably start chuckling, I always wish everybody good morning, no matter what hour it is in the 24 hours. And why is this? There's something very deep and uh, very meaningful, and very interesting happening here. So I'm looking at the chat, chat area here to see how people would respond. When I say good morning to anybody, I am honoring the sun rising somewhere on planet Earth at that very moment. So when it was 9.14 p.m. here, I want each one of you to start thinking, where would it be sunrise? Where would the sun be dawning at this moment on planet Earth? This is a question, a serious question. So I look forward to your answers. I'm sure you all have whipped out your Googles and your search engines and have started to look for the answer already. Please share. Now, there you are, I see a very warm good morning from one of you there. The other interesting thing is, why do I do this? It's because I want to honor the world. I want us to have a mindset, not of an Indian. I think being an Indian comes with an advantage and that advantage is left like a seed, left unborn. And all I want to do is to have you change your mindset into becoming what I call a global thinker. This is missing in our culture. And this is a very, very important reason why we never ever think of building world-class products from day one in India. Okay, a mindset does not think global. Let me give you a simple example. If any one of you here knows how to make a cup of tea, as simple as that, or make a very nice cup of coffee, that also is very simple. Already some of you are thinking of your grandma's recipes and you're saying, okay, um, maybe I can use cardamom and I can make a very nice spicy masala chai or tea. And the other person is thinking, oh, you know, I have this fantastic beets and I can just make coffee with this particular whip and this particular, let's say, cinnamon in it. And that's it. And then we will start talking about our culture. You see now, that's what I mean. A simple thing like a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, when somebody in, for example, United States of America decides to make one, they are already thinking of the world, that I would love to share this cup across the world. And of course, the brand that comes to your mind is Starbucks. That's an extremely simple example. Now look here, which culture is more rich in its cuisine in the world? In fact, the richest in the world in terms of its cuisines. And I say plural, it's India. Amazingly, I'm taking the simplest example here. Amazingly, we never think of the world, of sharing this with the world. So. Somebody was asking me, Niam, what are you going to talk about at the Institute of Product Leadership? So instead of answering that question, this happened about three days ago, I asked an extraordinarily simple question. I said, I give you exactly five minutes or maybe three minutes. And some of you here, please jump in into the chat and start responding. Can you think of 10 consumer products from India, which are world-class and available worldwide. And this pause is of course not because, see the iPhone is not from India, Siresha, it's from the US, right? So now there we are. The first one, which is a correct answer, is Fab India. Now look, many of you might just start going towards the IT industry. So of course this Paytm and OYO is of course moving over. That's wonderful. IKEA is definitely not Indian, please. Uh, Bira is definitely not India. Finacle is Indian. See, tea is a generic thing, Dheeraj Chha. 
I want you to think, but do you see what happened here? We are lost. And we are product leaders and managers and people who are going to make impact over the next hundred years. Hotmail was not from India. It could be of somebody from Indian Orange doing it from, from, from the US. It was at Apple. I, I happened to be at the Apple office that time when I heard in Bangalore when, when he launched Hotmail, but I'm diverging. Now, if I were to ask you to think of, for example, worldwide brands from America, you wouldn't stop gushing, right? You'd have Nike. You'd have Apple, you'd have Microsoft, you'd have Google, and you know, I'm just being obsessed with the IT industry. You can pick up, you know, every goddamn thing. For example, Stratocaster, you know, the guys who make guitars. And then there's Royal Enfield. Yep, there you are. You see how difficult it is to think of a pure consumer play. Incidentally, it did not occur to you, but there is Forest Essentials, which is fabulous. And there you are. Now, is it possible for a country uh, with 1.2 billion people to have, let's say, 10 million products from India which are world class. And there you go. Yes, there's Patanjali, there's beautiful people. Go on, keep sharing. And Tanmoy, I'm glad to see your optimism there and you're saying sure. And I'm saying, all right, so let's lay the seeds today. Okay, this, this beautiful moment in time between all of us right now is not just for you to be able to gain insights, but for each one of you to be a seed carrier or being able to go out tomorrow morning into the world with ideas you garner and you, you engulf yourself within this and share it across with everybody, your teams, your colleagues and everybody and say, you know what, let's just everybody start thinking of the world you know that saying in Sanskrit, you know, the world is mine, you know, and everybody in the world is mine, and the world community is my community. And can we start, can we stop thinking of being within our cultural borders and going worldwide? And here comes a very interesting thing. Can we not think of the world as being an English speaking world? So what I'm going to do now is fascinating. I, as Menka already mentioned, that I don't like to make powerless, pointless presentations. And um, I decided to make a mind map live while we do this session. So I'm going to, uh, uh, I want to take over the screen for a minute and I'm going to share <clears throat> my screen here just to see if I can uh, just a second people just one second yeah if I can share my desktop perhaps and do you get to see my mind map here people um, I'm just trying to yep there you are um, Yeah, can you can you see my 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 mind map on the screen? Yeah, you can. Okay, brilliant. So what you see me do here is say that there are two things required to build world class products from India. One is a mindset, which is far more important, and then one is a framework. A framework is nothing; you can drop it away. And I promised, or rather, IPL promised that we will give you eleven point framework, but I have much more. I'm going to shut it down. That was a sneak peek. Here's the mindset. So for each one of you to make a world-class product, the first thing that you need to do is to have a mindset, which I call, which is four point. The first is individual mindset. I don't know if you realize this. Our culture is so deep that our mind is not individual in our own country. Our mind is a collective mind. And you need to have a global mind. A global mind is one that thinks of multiple, multiple cultures and the entire world away from us. So this very moment, let me see how many of you can think of non-English speaking cultures. Could you please type answers here? There you go, China, Japan. That's excellent. Superb, Africa, look at this. Africa is a continent, by the way. French, Hindi is definitely not, you know, outside of borders. Koreans, Tamils are definitely not there. Do you see what's happening here, people? Russians, brilliant. So you're beginning to see the world this way. Now, I'm going to take this deeper. 
in China, can you think of the different kinds of cultures? In Italy, would you be able to make yourself sensitive to Southern Italy versus Northern Italy? Australia, East versus West, are there any differences? City versus, you know, outbacks, are there differences? Russia, Russia has got, I think last time I counted, I think they have 11 time zones, the largest country in the world. Outstanding, isn't it? So, for a minute, think of this entire world as your relatives, all of them. Okay, and um, what we want you, what I want you to do is, as an individual, imbibe friends, make friends, learn about different cultures. If you're on Netflix, this is the first set, you know, watch movies in different, different languages and cultures, like a Turkish film. Or, or a Spanish film, and you'll find it fascinating that the world is essentially the same. Not only that, but open yourself to other mindsets in the world. How do people think differently? And you will find this fascinating, and then whatever product you're building, even if it's a tea bag. By the way, look, I'm not even talking about IT. IT is easy. It's brilliant to think about consumer products here. Think about how you would like to sell Tea to Mongolians, now that's fascinating. Or for example, or one of the most famous examples from the 20th century is, how would you sell a refrigerator to an Eskimo? That was actually a question asked about 100 years ago. That's brilliant, right? These are the kind of questions Bata asked, you know? How do you sell shoes to the entire continent of Africa? So that's the first thing. Individually, I want you to think of yourself in the world at any minute. And the best way to think of yourself in the world is at any given moment, think, where is the sun rising at this moment? Incidentally, people, it's been 12 minutes since I asked that question. I still don't know where the sun is rising at this minute. Where could it be? Would it be Japan? Would it be somewhere in Australia? Would it be, I'm not saying it. Can you think? All right, early morning. Okay, sorry about this background noise, I wonder where it is. So, okay, the next thing is culture. Culture is a very interesting thing. There's a book that I would like to recommend to all of you. I'm gonna type it here. It's called The Culture Map of the World. I think it's a brilliant book, you know. I've been reading it and recommending it to people, world, to everybody, everywhere in the world. And it's fascinating that each one of us tends to look at every other culture in the world through our culture. You cannot discard your Indian culture and look at any other culture of the world. It's impossible. However, you need to. I, I mean, for example, look at Hollywood films. They have their own strong culture, but they open to blockbuster openings worldwide. Do you know we are the largest country in the world when it comes to storytelling? Look at our cornucopia of literature. But how come we're not doing world stories? We have world-class stories, but we don't know yet how to productize them. Okay, then we come to our social factor. The social factor is a very fascinating factor. And you can see the problem here in India, forget about the problem worldwide. If a Punjabi from North India, and I am Punjabi from North India, travels down to, let's say, Andhra, it's kind of interesting to see them say, I'm going to South India. No, no, man, South India has got like five states. And you will see that they would still choose their own food, not try to understand the language of Andhra or the culture of the cuisine so much, and vice versa, you know. And if, if you go into Madhya Pradesh, nobody really looks deep into the cuisines, into the language, into the dialects or anything. We stick to our culture. There have been very deep studies being done. And I met a woman last week and it got me thinking very deeply about, you know, she did a PhD in diversity and Indian cultures. So one of the things is, for example, when I come from Africa as well, so in Kenya, from where my, my parents had a home, the Punjabis have their own community and the Gujaratis have their own community. They're in the same world. And socially they keep close. And then they also marry within their community. It's really fascinating. So 
but contrast with the rest of the culture of the world. For example, the Japanese or the Americans or the Scandinavians or whoever, when they travel, they immerse themselves into the cultures of the rest of the world, wherever they are. They would rub shoulders with you. They would eat your food no matter how much fire there is in it. They would like to learn your language. They would like to know your history, your culture, everything. And this is why they end up building world-class products because they bother about understanding cultures. So the first, and, and, and society and things like that. So socially, we need to open up ourselves into being able to think like that. The next thing in the mindset is the X factor. Now this X factor is very fascinating. I use it all the time when I'm mentoring startups. I've mentored over 200 startups and I've seen this problem in each one of them. The thinking is never tangential or divergent. For example, everybody, I'll give you a very simple example. People say that I'm building a product for the world and I see that they've, you know, or, or they just build something for themselves in India, for themselves. Do you understand for themselves? For themselves means for the person building the product. The person building the product thinks that everybody in the world is like me. And so whatever they build, they say, I'm building for the version of me, which is there. And so all the me's in the world will understand what I'm building. And it is for the world, which is fascinating. We have just filled the worlds with clones of ourselves. And one of my first questions to them is, is this on a website or on the Play Store? They obviously say yes. I say, you know, an IP address has no geographical boundary, does it? So your product is going to the world at one shot. Have you considered people who speak Mandarin? Look, I'm not using the word Chinese. Okay, have you, have you considered people in Japan? Have you considered how they look at it? How do you, have you looked at people in, Mid, in, in the Middle East? Uh, how, they, how they read Arabic, you know? Right to left, bottom to top. How do your layouts and designs work there? It's fascinating that nobody's ever tried to do that. So let's take a very, very simple example. Let's take, let's say a very Indian thing. Let's take the, let's take Meru camps from India. You know, something, something as simple as that. If I were to handle something with them, I would simply ask them, okay, so if a, so if a Japanese elderly couple land in India, would they be able to order this? How difficult would it be? You know, and certainly people are thinking, hmm, I've never thought about that. And I can go on endlessly. But look carefully, our hospitals, they've started to understand there's medical tourism happening in India. And now very cleverly, they're starting to align themselves to people coming from different cultures. And that's how this thing is booming. I'm saying, why should it be retrofitted? Why can't we push it in, uh, in the first place? And that's right, Tanmoy. There is a saying, if you can't learn the language, eat the local food to connect with locals, then you haven't really connected. That's correct, Anmoy. Thanks for sharing that. So this X factor is the moment you start, immediately think of somebody in a non-English speaking culture and say, how would it work there? Small girl in France, for example, for let's say a toy that you make in Gujarat. Okay, all right. Now that you've kind of understood the mindset, I just want to know, do you have a question on the mindset? I hope you understand that tomorrow, at the end of this webinar, I want each of you to tell yourself, you belong to the world, you think for the world, you are of the world, and you will give to the world. Do you have any question of the mindset that you need? Anybody? All good, so I would assume that it's 9.33. Most of you have fallen fast asleep. You may catch the recording tomorrow morning. I move to the framework. Um, uh, the framework is interesting, the three pillars of productizing. Uh, anybody here knows the three pillars of productizing or could you guess it? I shall wait for your responses here. What do you think are the three pillars of productizing today? Anybody? Nope. Okay. So the three pillars of productizing have to do with any product that you were to build today. 
whether uh, uh, from operation mindset design engineering business the three pillars of productizing are that when you build a product concurrently it's not just a thing it will also be a service and it can't just be a service there will, there will be a component of service to it so the the world of product design and service design have blurred this is fabulous yes ka that's correct i'm assuming ka here stands for karan agarwal who would probably know this and the third is of course behavior that anything that you build is to be successful will have to impact behavior and behavior design is the biggest aspect of any design let's take a simple example let's say you wish to build a uh, twitter so twitter is a product twitter is also a sort of a service that runs off the web and twitter has impacted behavior so has google right now for many things it's a first go to look at google maps it's a product it's also a service and it is also impacting behavior take a look at netflix netflix is more of a service but you need to build products for it the products are movies then they offer it to you as a service and what you discover fascinatingly is that it is having a huge impact on social and cultural behavior so as a designer i tell you that what you need to ask is that how will you impact behavior with your product so incidentally whoever invented tea was not just inventing a product they were inventing something that would impact behavior for years right and those and those things were so somebody says will not define scope time and cost with the driving factor of consideration in our mindset facets so yeah well that is a different thing when you talk about scope time and cost be the driving factor for consideration of mindset facets you're talking about productizing about looking at viabilities uh, which is a different loop that we do in design thinking we look at you know what is desirable what is feasible what is viable and then we use these factors there a mindset is a very interesting thing let me explain mindset in one line to you it is the mind that creates wealth once you understand this you will understand that productizing is about creating wealth out of thin air now when you have to create wealth out of thin air what is the mindset that is required that is the mindset of a productizing person of a design thinker somebody who creates value who sees value who generates value around an idea and says you know what if i put normal water in a plastic bottle and i sell it for 10 bucks i'm going to solve a problem for the world that they can carry and dispose this with them people might laugh and say hey you know water is free and anybody would want it why would somebody pay 10 bucks well it turns out to be people are now paying 100 bucks for a bottle of water so that is a mindset now that mindset to build a world class product is one which first understands how to think for the world of the world with empathy so the first thing in the framework is if you're going worldwide you have to see how you impact especially behavior behavior design is interesting because it is based on habits what you build will either break a habit or it will form a new habit or first it will break a habit and form a new habit and so any product that you see has got that aspect of it now of course it, we have very little time in which to cover how to create habit forming products what is habit how important is the fox behavior model is the hook model complete my answer to that is no it's a work in progress but may i recommend for those of you interested please read the book hook about how habit forming products are built and how successful ones are built and you'll be able to understand that you will have to have cultural nuances in the world with which to create those so you know over starts in the world but it has become a habit it has brought about behavior design impact worldwide i don't know if you know this but there have been protests people have burnt uber cars they have you know unions have gone on strike worldwide you know and that is the mindset it's that mindset somebody somewhere came up with the idea of an uber 
that was well thought of thin air and took it all over the world from day one. That's the beauty of thinking like that. And we are 1.2 billion people. The second point, I think all of us in India, and we must be candid and honest about it, need to understand, we need to stop plagiarism. Plagiarism is very, very simple. Just copy and paste what is being built abroad blindly without thinking and saying, here, I built this too. And this is like a me too, without being a hash me too tag, but it's still very embarrassing that we simply find a product abroad and we say, hey, I'm going to build this here, which is a very simple open game. But because there is no value in it, there is nothing there. I'll mention below there are other points. These kind of products have a very difficult journey. Um, it's interesting to notice that Flipkart started like that. Uh, Amazon was not here, so let's just build something like Amazon. The same concept, the same ideas. It's not original. However, they solved a lot of logistics problems to their credit. They did finances to a lot of issues, but because they were essentially just, you know, like uh, Amazon, and even their website looked like Amazon, but in orange, all they were doing was solving problems for Amazon as an early burner and hoping that, you know, something would happen. And I think that, you know, it needed X factors to it as well. It's not just Amazon. It's not just Flipkart. You can think of a million things from our childhood. We had something very infamous called Campa Cola, which was like Coca-Cola from India after foreign brands were banned here. There was IDM, which was like an IBM in this country. Look, even the names are similar. And uh, unless you bring something more to the table, I think plagiarism is not a great idea and we don't want to be the capital in the world of plagiarist ideas. So how do we build world-class products from India? The answer is in point number three, cultural infusion. One of the first brands that you think of when you think of world-class products is Fab India. And then I mentioned Forest Essentials. Um, anybody else? Could you, could you come up with uh, with another uh, product name. A rocket internet is into cloning startup. <laughs> Brilliant. So cultural infusion is genius. The idea that we are in India and every culture has a very different story. And if we can infuse our culture into our product, but make it worldwide and make it world-class, it will go and impact people positively. I have thought about this very, very deeply many times because we really solve problems sometimes for ourselves, which the world has not solved. I'll give you an example. In India, we had terrible power, you know, as in uh, power as in electricity. Supply of electricity was erratic, was terrible. It uh, suffered from spikes, surges, noise, lots of stuff. A lot of equipment would blow up. And then, you know, we wanted power conditioning equipment like UPSs and inverters and so forth. This is about 30 years ago. Now things are better. And what we noticed, for example, was that uh, APC, an American power conditioning company, came to India. And the initial state was incredible because they discovered that uh, they were not designed for the extreme outages that were happening in India. So word spread around that maybe APC is not really meant for Indian markets. We need tougher equipment. And so a lot of brands initially thrived here until APC and the others got into the game and understood how to build more resilient products for India. But the interesting thing is nobody ever understood that if India had built for itself this kind of resilient power conditioning systems, they could have exported it in turn to poorer countries in Africa where there were equally bad situations of power and we would have had a world-class product design and product emerging from India solving problems around the world. This is just one example. I can think of billions more. Um, so apart from plagiarism and cultural infusion, let's, let's think of more examples of cultural infusion. Uh, somebody mentioned Haldiram. Uh, Think about Haldiram. How do you make Indian Mithai world class? Many of you will say it is world class. But let me ask you this. 
Have you noticed every store in India, every petrol station, every confectionery shop today has chocolates? Chocolates are not Indian, right? A chocolate comes from abroad and a chocolate is world class. I've, I've traveled across the world. Anywhere I go at any airport, I get to see chocolates. Not only do I get to see chocolates, I get to see branded chocolates. I see branded chocolates from different regions and different countries and different cultures of the world. This is fascinating. I also see that there are chocolates being made in India, which are fascinating. There is one startup I've been mentoring and they have made a superb new organic style of chocolate. I've met one in Bangalore. They're also doing the same thing and they just need the scale to go forward. But that's chocolate for you. So we take an international idea, indigenize it, and then take it back to the world. But what about our own sweets? Can I see, let's say, gulab jams or mithai or basin mithai or whatever is your Indian dessert made into a global product? So people would ask for it by name and by brand and not just one brand. Like, you know, there are thousands of brands from here, but we don't think like that. We make them and we are just so content. Um, yes, that's correct. Your name is one plus one. I hope one plus is going to give you lots of money for endorsing their brand. But yes, cultural infusion is similar to localized products, except there's one other aspect to it. The cultural infusion, there are two aspects to it. First is that you infuse the local culture of the market you're going into to build a story around your brand. For example, how Volkswagen uh, infused India's culture into its advertising to sell Volkswagen in India. On the other, other, other hand, Volkswagen was pride, proud of its uh, genetics in German design and engineering, right? So cultural infusion is being able to understand India's culture and infuse India's culture into a world-class product. One of the most surprising products at one time which was globally recognized as India and with pride was Air India. This was like in the 70s, it was amongst the top airlines in the world because it did not give up on its Indian culture and roots. It was very distinct, it was very iconic. Now, beyond cultural infusion, the fourth point is very interesting. It flows from it, it's non-introspective. So as I was mentioning earlier, in our mindset, we are introspective. And we are always thinking about ourselves and we only think about maximum our subculture within our cultures. Um, this is kind of fascinating. I would love to see this not happening in our products because when you look at our products, our products are also introspective. Our products tell you, this is meant for me, from me, by me. And, uh, and somebody just mentioned another. Local exchanges built by CDOT were a success even in Europe. Yes, Anand, I did kind of work with CDOT at one time. And that's true because they built very resilient ones. You know, the point is in India, we have great engineering, great product. But the thing that we lack is this mindset. Tata, by the way, I don't know how many of you realize it. Tata's Titan. Titan has built the world's tennis watch. And they continue to hold that record. And that's a world-class watch. I used to buy a lot of uh, international brands of watches. And then I bought a, a, a Titan Edge, as it was called, 14 years ago, my favorite watch. And I was very stunned at its engineering. And I said, you know what? Every time I travel in the world, I want to see a Titan Edge at every goddamn airport in the world. And not just airport, but the high streets or high fashion streets everywhere in the world. When are we going to get there? The Suresha Jaguar was not an Indian product. It was bought by Tata in India and, you know, just nurtured and nourished and taken back into the world. I'm saying, I don't know if you realize this, Oberoi's, the Oberoi hotels, that's a world-class product and service from India. In terms of hospitality, they're outstanding. Um, I have a list of products. I shall soon reveal a few more. The next thing that is important is brand story and product story. You see, in India, I think most of you by now must have studied this at IPL as well. We tend to be performance and property obsessed of any product. And design thinking tells you that people buy by preference, not by 
property or performance. This comes as a complete shock to engineering and productizing people, but that's how the human mind works. Each one of you in this seminar today, think about the smartphone that you bought. It doesn't matter which one you bought. What I want you to shed light on is the fact that each one of you had first decided which smartphone in principle to buy, and then looked for reasons to fortify why you wanted to buy that one at whatever price point you had chosen. So it starts from whether iOS or Android. First, you chose that as a preference. Once you chose that, then you went searching for properties and performances and everything and said, this is why. And it's fascinating because when people say, yep, that's one reason why I do it, I can then point out that, well, you know, if you wanted just that, there's another brand, another model, which has this even better. And that's when I catch everybody. And yet I haven't failed each time I do this. Same is true for the kind of clothes you're wearing right now, the colors and tones you choose, it's your preference, and then you look for properties. Once you understand, uh, who is this exactly? Order winner and order qualifier, correct. Thank you so much, Karpagim. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And Anant, you're right, cultural inclusion, GE introduced portable ECG machines to cater to rural India. That's sad, you know, why isn't it an Indian company? Because I saw one in Hyderabad about six years ago designing the first portable ECG machine in India, which was fantastic, taking it to the world. It's been six years, nobody's heard of them. Um, that's what I'm talking about. You are all thinking of bringing world-class products to India and making them more successful. I'm thinking of building world-class products from India and making them successful in different cultures of the world. And what is the mindset to start with? You know, and then we solve the logistics further. So uh, once we move to that, to the brand story, once you got the preference in mind, then you have to build the brand story very carefully and the product story. Fab India's brand story is truly, truly, truly fascinating, right? They have a photograph of Gandhi there, Mahatma Gandhi. And you walk in, it's all about Indian culture, Indian tribes, Indian colors, Indian cloth, Indian textile, and geometric designs for the world, taste, and off you go. Until I ask you, how come it is not Khadi Udyog Bhavan? That should have been world class here. In fact, both of them are going to Indian culture. Both of them are connecting into, you know, weavers and handlooms across India. Both of them make Khadi, actually, authentically speaking, Khadi Udyog Bhavan makes more authentic Khadi than perhaps Fab India. I believe there's a controversy there right now about that. But it never occurs to anybody that, you know, this is a product that could be world class. It's Fab India. So I want to ask you this question later. What is it about Fab India that makes it world class versus Khadi Udyog Bhavan? And if you were the product director at Khadi Udyog Bhavan, how would you make it world class? So people would prefer the preference goes to Khadi Udyog Bhavan and not say, for example, Fab India. It's just a very simple challenge, a design challenge to you. And the brand story is very interesting. Why would India win on brand stories if we just give up our obsession? about uh, property and performance of a product. You will discover India is the greatest storyteller in the world. We understand emotions better and deeper. And even in our cultural treatise, we have written down the norus and different nuances of emotions. And we are a rich, emotionally rich and emotionally nuanced culture. We should be able to build brand stories and product stories, which is what people buy. So when you buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks, you're actually buying a brand story. We need to have a strong one. We have a strong one with Amul. Amul is fantastic. Then more India, Fab India is about celebrating India. You need to go deeper. So is, uh, so is uh, Khadi Deog Bhavan. Why not then? Um, and then I come to the concept of non-indic, non-avuncular. Let me explain these words. You have heard the word vernacular. Vernacular means, comes from the Latin word verna, which means slave. So when we were under the British Raj, vernacular was an obscene, insulting term to talk about anything that belongs to the natives as if belonging to the slaves. So vernacular languages are languages of the slaves, which is actually quite appalling 
because as you know, Hindic languages are vastly superior in many ways and rich in their grammar and in their lexicon and everything. And they're definitely not the language of a slave. So the term that we use is Indic. What is Indic? Indic is not just the political boundaries of modern India, but Indic languages go all the way to Thailand, Philippines, and far off, even to the East and so forth. So what I'm saying is when we think of building a product, we become Indic in our naming, in our communication. And that's sad and tragic because not everybody understands Hindi or Telugu or Tamil. So we need to be able to, or, or even our nuances like our cultural or religious metaphors in our names. So sometimes I often point it out to people that if you come up with a name which is very Hindu, the non-Hindus are not going to like it. Okay, and, and I've checked, I don't know, countless companies in India doing that. Non-avuncular. Avuncular means like an uncle. You know, uncle is somebody who's older to you and commands or demands respect and says, I, I ordain this for you. So many products in India are designed with the concept that, oh, you know, I'm saying that this is for you, you must use it. There is no sensitivity towards the user and, you know, and being and rubbing shoulders with that person. And in that, and of course, and in that light, I come to the next point, which is empathy. Design with empathy is a very big thing. I would like each one of you to Google a lot to find out what is this word empathy. It means feeling with. Sympathy we understand feeling for, but empathy is very, very powerful. The idea of feeling with, the idea of being able to understand how this product, what feelings it would evoke in the people I build it for and how. Okay, so I'll give you a very simple example. Actually, the United Nations has pointed out that the biggest opportunity, economic opportunity of the 21st century lies in the unusual fact for the first time we have aging populations worldwide. We have people who are beginning to surpass the age of 60 with ease, actually 70 and working, 80, 90, some countries like Japan, they touch 100 and even more. And in some ethnic parts of China, and other countries, they are exceeding 100 as well. Interestingly, these people are usually fit, hearty, traveling. They've got lots of money, they've retired, they've got time on their hands. And they want to enjoy the comforts of the world as well, except that we are too obsessed with youngsters in the world. You want an example? How many of you here have to order an Uber for your perfectly literate, educated parents or grandparents? that shows a huge blind sight on behalf of Uber, who has not yet understood that actually it's those people who actually need to order an Uber even more than let's say other segments. And yet they haven't been able to solve this problem through design. And so I often do this very interesting study, design with empathy. How would you design or how would you redesign Uber so that older people could use it without having to fumble for their bifocals or look at tiny screens or try to figure out where the car is and where it's not. Try to get your grannies and your grandpas and your great grannies and grandpas to understand this point. You'll see what I mean. Now, over and above uh, empathy, I come to this fascinating point, which is incredible. Divergent empathy. This is one of my ideas. Um, when you build a product, can you think of five contradictory cultures and then find empathy in them while you're thinking of your product to see how would it work there? This is, this is superb. So for example, if you're building for, let's say Dubai and Middle East and Saudi Arabia, can your product also concurrently be built and designed to be sold in Israel, which is a complete counterculture there. And if you're building something for let's say Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands or something, are you also thinking of Argentinians, which is like Latin, far away. So I like to pick up these cultures. My favorite obsession these days, you'll see me say this all the time, is Japanese. Just to understand the culture, I spent about a year trying to learn the three scripts of Japan and trying to learn the language and watch their series and 
TV shows and everything over Netflix and YouTube. It's super fascinating. How many of you can breach into the markets in Japan? At the same time, think of, uh, of, of a counter market somewhere else, you know, completely off. So when you do empathy, listen to this powerful idea. Can you hold opposing ideologies and empathize with them concurrently. Now, why should we be able to do that in India? Because if you study our culture, if you study our philosophy, our vision, it's the only culture in the world that says the opposite of truth is also truth. This is absolutely mind blowing. Nobody else says that. And once you understand the power of this idea, you will understand no matter how much people in the world want to show they're different, we're all alike in our differences. And we need to build products which can bridge over these walls of the world. So try divergent empathy with your products. An example, can you build a product for the super elite in let's say France and Switzerland and concurrently build a product for the poorest of the poor in let's say Zimbabwe or Ethiopia and say, you know what, here's a problem for the world. And you discover that you can, and you can actually create subclasses of your products, but uh, it's a beautiful thought. The next thing which is missing in India in my framework is if your product does not fail, it will never be successful. So do you design for failure? Failure is a very beautiful thing. And I've tried to explain that in India, in many countries, in many companies and enterprises. And I must proudly state that most of the time I fail. I fail in explaining failure to companies that are failing in front of my eyes. And that's why they call me to help them. And that too, with large stakes, you know, at hand, with thousands of man hours and hundreds of people onto a huge team and two years gone by, products failing. And then I say, but you are not designing for failure. That's why you're failing. So what is designed for failure? And how do you do, how do you build products around failure, hypothesis and vulnerability? These three points are extremely simple to understand. Number one, a product, a product design is not a product design until it ships. So whatever you're building in the doors of your factory, in your home, in your garage, in your company, on your computer or whatever it is, on your textile cloth machine, it is a hypothesis. It's your idea that this is going to be successful. You can only know it's successful once you ship it. And my experience shows that no product is ever successful on its first shipping, ever. It's just almost like a prototype which has been sent out to the market, there are bound to be issues with it. So I call that, once it ships, I still don't call it a product design, I call it a humbling experience. Because the market does something known as usability. They come up with different ways in which to use your product. And you may think that probably the trousers are gonna sell 10 to one, somebody just buying silk scarves. And this of course, oh, each one of you would have felt in your industry. Second interesting thing is that you must design for vulnerability. Vulnerability is very interesting. Vulnerability means, um, no, we're not talking about vulnerability and accessibility challenges one plus. Uh, but vulnerability means it is vulnerable to failure. It is vulnerable because the idea does not have to be too fortified. If it doesn't work, we should be able to pivot it. Now I'm sure all of you are learning product. You understand the important role of pivoting in product design. So KA wants to know, you mean to say it's not perfect? Yes, KA, that's true. In India, we obsess in trying to build a perfect product and life is beautifully imperfect and perfect products never become successful. An example of a perfect product, I don't know if you remember this, was IBM OS slash two. It was perfect, but MS-DOS, as you all know from your experiences in Windows, was crashing and burning and giving you lots of problems, but OS2 never took off. There was no reason why OS2 would not take off, but it did not. IBM suffered a crushing defeat on that operating system. So 
when I come into vulnerability, I mean that you know that your product could fail. It's like a baby, right? And you really need to take care of your baby. And what happens when companies ship their product? They are exhausted. They don't have the stamina. They think now that we've shipped it, it's now the marketing guy's problem and they want to take it easy, take the holidays, take it off and whatever. Actually, work starts on day one, 12 hours after you ship. That's when the first signals come in, the first feedback, the humbling experiences. That's when you start building a product that will become successful. And this is a constant innovation loop, by the way. And this is a very, very powerful idea how to build for vulnerability. So if you look carefully, the first versions of any product is never successful. No version one is ever, ever successful. It takes two or three versions before they get there. But most people in India just give up because they put in so much effort in building the perfect product and then they lose. Of course, empathy also means, uh, to go back to another point, that you need to be able to understand your user personas very well. The problem is we talk about user personas in India when I'm doing my consulting with clients or products. Ultimately, they only talk market segmentations and psychographics, which is 20th century thinking of management. It does not apply in the 21st century. People in this group do not call yourself a product guy unless you know how to successfully build a user persona and how to successfully build a user journey and how to successfully use other design thinking tools. That's the level of detail we need to work in in today's age. And many companies, in fact, 90% of the companies I work with don't really do it. And the 10% who do, they make a user persona as a theoretical exercise, put it away, and then they go back into 20th century thinking. The last idea is a completely different idea on which I'm going to end. It's called Creative Commons, something that Menka and I just sporadically discuss. So you all owe a little tip of the hat and gratitude to Menka for bringing this in. I'm going to mention a product to each one of you, which will zap you because, you know, wow, how come you never thought of building a product like this? Have you heard of Linux? Have you heard of Android? These are the world's most blockbuster successful products ever built. Have you heard of uh, what approach do you suggest for already existing legacy business to reap benefits of design thinking? Oh, that's a big question. Let's take it later. So I was talking about Linux. I was talking about Android. Look at Google itself, except that Google is using uh, services which are in a wall card. But have you heard of Arduino? And Arduino is fascinating. It gives birth to the world of physical computing, so on. These products are built on the premise that knowledge has to be free, that ideas have to be shared freely. And this is missing in our culture. We are only interested in free ideas, free tools, free knowledge, if we can plunder and harvest and use them for our benefit but we never think of ourselves giving it away. But look at tea. The recipe of tea is muft and mukt. I'm using Hindi words here, people. Muft is a Hindi word which means free of cost. Mukt is a Hindi word which means with freedom. So chai or tea is muft and mukt. The recipe is open source. Anybody, anywhere can make a cup of tea. Not only does it have the freedom, you also have the freedom to change the recipe. You can add cardamom or cinnamon or whatever you like into it. And not only that, you have, you have the freedom to make it into a tea bag and sell it. You have freedom to make infusions. Look at the way it has gone into world cultures. And the best freedom is you have the freedom to give it free of cost or you have the freedom to charge for it. So you can actually give away a tea to somebody for 200 rupees and you can give it free of cost and that's the beauty of freedom freedom to give it free of cost freedom to give it at whatever price you wish the market could demand and freedom for somebody else to also do the same i love muft and mukt i've devoted 14 years of my life to this my question to each one of you have written editorials about this how come linux was not born in india 
Look at its impact. It's shaken the roots of Microsoft. It brought down the large and mighty to its knees. It gave birth to billion, trillion dollar companies like for Google and Amazon and so on, based on you know all its open source nets and everything. Look at Apache. And look at Android, right? It's built on Linux. And Android exists because Linux was given away free. In fact, the Mac OS is completely based on freebie on Mac kernel, which is also open source. In India, here is a powerful question. Can you think of a world-class product from India, which is based on open source licenses or Creative Commons licenses? Anybody? All right, you give up? The answer is Pratham Books. Pratham Books started from Bangalore. These are books for children. The books are published under a Creative Commons license. I would encourage all of you to go read up on Creative Commons. And in a state dwindling, sunsetting industry like book publishing, up comes a new player who comes and disrupts the entire industry not because the stories are new, not because the illustration are great or not great, and not because the production is world-class or not world-class. It's because these books are at a price point of around 10 rupees or less or 15 or 16 rupees. And the most amazing thing, these books are moft than moft. So you can buy these books with children, but you can download these books for free from the internet. You, are, you have the freedom to republish the books and sell them again if you like. You have the freedom to download the books, translate them, give them away. Oh my God, you, you, you have the freedom to call children together and sit down and write them and give them away. It's fascinating. I want to ask you, I'm glad that at least we have Pratham Books in India, which has made a world-class product. I have worked with Pratham, I've consulted with them a few years ago and I completely understand the thinking, but how come we don't have like a million more products in every industry? Let's take Ayurveda, for example. Ayurveda belongs to the public domain, but the revolution in the world in design from India, if a modern Ayurvedic pharmaceutical company is born that is selling its Ayurvedic products under an open source license in the world, allowing people anywhere in the world to grow their own herbs, their own ingredients, and using this Ayurvedic formula that the company is giving away and saying, go ahead, make these medicines for diabetes and for this and that, and you know, off you go. Look at the fascinating thing that will happen. And once you understand this, you'll understand what I mean by cultural infusion. KA here is mentioning yoga for example. You know, yoga is a multi, multi, multi billion dollar industry, one of the first multi billion dollar industries. So is tea, by the way, a multi billion dollar industry from India. But India has never taken claim on these. I feel the time has come for all of us to be able to do this. Now, I'm going to stop right here. And this was just flowing from my heart non stop. It's 10 12 p.m. in India. That's about one hour that I've taken off your time. Again, I wish to know where is the sun dawning in the world at this very moment, if I were to say good morning. And I wish the answer would not just be, for example, in Japan or some parts of Eastern New Zealand, but for each one of you in this room, in your hearts and minds, the 22 participants of this room, I wish there is sunrise in your hearts and minds. With that, I end this. And if you have any questions, I'm right here for you. Menka. Thank you uh, so much, Niam. Uh, I'm sure you know we would have loved to hear more, but uh, given the time constraint, uh, you know maybe we will have another session. I think we need another session by you. And thank you so much for this wonderful session. So can I read out, uh, in the Q&A window, we have got some uh, questions. Yeah. Would you like to uh, go ahead and okay. pick up whatever you see? <clears throat> right, so the first one I've already answered. Second I've answered, product comes first or brand comes first? Oh, that's a chicken and egg question. Um, I face this all the time. Sometimes a brand can come much later. Sometimes rebranding can take an old product and you know reimagine it. 
for example, WhatsApp just got over bought over by by Facebook, and so forth. So, product or brand, whichever comes first, doesn't really matter. What comes first is a story, and that's what's missing here. In fact, if you're very very interested, I would heartily like to recommend Deepthi Pant from the Truth School, who is one of India's greatest storytellers for corporates and for companies and for everything, who's bringing about a design revolution through just pure story telling and ideation and of course that's missing in india so if you look at the story first then it doesn't matter whether you stumble across it through a product or a brand i hope that answers your question yes. uh, the next one is uh, is it worthwhile to understand the key problem faced by end users and accordingly generate possible ways to address the same in the most efficient way and the answer to that is if you are a product person, I want you all to hold the mantra in your heart. And that mantra is get out of your own way. You are the problem. Just think you are not there, only the user. And don't even go and try to find out what the problem of a user is and try to solve it. That's a very shallow method. First, empathize by being a user. First, empathize by trying to understand what it means to be that person. Give dignity and respect and reverence to that person for who they are without looking for problems. Because the fact that you're looking for a problem, you already have a bias with which you've moved in. And then you will discover fascinating problems that need to be solved. Example, Ratan Tata at this age is saying that the problem to solve in India, after all these blockbuster decades of business growth that he's brought in, and the accolades that is heap is bringing safe drinking water to people in India. I mean, that's fascinating. That's truly fascinating. And how he's working hard towards it. So I think what we need is empathy, not problem solving. Empathy will then lead to understanding a problem from feeling, not understanding a problem from metrics. And then saying from the feeling qualitative aspect, how will I solve it? And then quantifying your response to that one. This is a very good question. We need to look at this. I've, I've answered vulnerability and accessibility. This is a good question. What approach do you suggest for already existing legacy business to reap benefits of design thinking? Uh, what approach do you suggest? I would I would recommend uh, there are two there are two or three methods of design. It depends on the legacy business and how to reimagine and refresh them. One is one I call rip the band-aid. You know, you can't just take a bandaid out slowly. Sometimes you just have to clutch it, wince and rip it off, which of course leads to a lot of disruption. But then you have to do it very carefully. The second method is iterative. Slowly, slowly, bit by bit, small things change every day until one day you look back and a million things change and you never realize how the brand was completely shedding its old skin and becoming a new brand or a new product. The third method is through disruption, where you bring disruption through design thinking internal, which means that you create what is known as a skunk works in your own office. And then you say to the skunk works, you know, before somebody else disrupts us, you try to disrupt us. And this leads to what I call 2.5x design thinking, the ability of you to outsmart your competition internally, because you're using this framework I call 2.5x, which is very big to explain in this workshop, but it is inspired by a game designed in India called chess, where the knight, or what you know as the ghora, moves in a two and a half step on the chessboard. And uh, Srinivasan wants to know, can you explain on credit cards? Srinivasan loves you so much for this question. I don't know who you are, I don't know where you are, but your question is fantastic. Anytime anybody in India wants to know about Creative Commons, I know somewhere a candle is being lit and a million candles are gonna get lit and today, tonight Srinivasan, you're gonna be that lit candle. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm going to do a share on the screen. Can you see my screen at this moment, people? Yes. Okay, so what I did was I already opened Creative Commons website here for you. And this is what Creative Commons is. Creative Commons is the idea um, that the public domain is disappearing and we need to know how we need to share our authored works. Okay, think about it. There is nothing that you can build in the world without having first had somebody in the world 
who shared something with you on which you built your knowledge and your product ultimately to build it. Example, somebody must have shared the alphabet with you, you know, when you were a kid, ABC or numbers or counting or simple mathematics and so forth and so on until you build. So how can you now deny all of that and say, this is only mine? Creative Commons tries to solve that problem because we are acutely facing this problem. I'll give you a fantastic example. Did you know that the works of Rabindranath Tagore until very recently had not fallen into the public domain? And so only a few, I mean, a publisher or two owned the copyright. It is only a hundred years later of, of, you know, the works that, that they fell into the public domain. Now every publisher in India has got the freedom to publish the works of Rabindranath Tagore and to sell them for whatever price they love. This is fascinating. And so they survive, they thrive. And Creative Commons is used by Pratham Books for all the licensing of their books. I'm very, very pleased to keep talking about Pratham Books here because they've really killed it. I would like to talk about a project I was kind of aware of obliquely from the side. It's called the OSDD. They had approached me. I know the co-founders and other people there. Something that I talked about. OSDD stands for Open Source Drug Discovery. It's fabulous. Uh, started in 2008. Take a look. The idea that medicines should be under this license. So let me this, explain Creative Commons. Srinivas, may I recommend, uh, please take a look at the Creative Commons license. Take a photograph, take a poem, take anything. These are the different kind of things that people are publishing under a Creative Commons license. So in case you want to know, many can I already discussed this, this mind map that I have made for all of you in this uh, conversation today is going to be published under a Creative Commons license. Is that correct, Menka, under IPL? Yes. yes. The second thing, this video webinar itself is going to be published under a Creative Commons license. And just like T, that gives you the power to share it, to build upon it, to do what you like commercially, non-commercially, depending on the license that we chose here from Creative Commons. So I'd love to hear from India how many companies are leveraging Creative Commons licensing in their products to build blockbuster products which outclass any 20th century thinking. If Linux was not under the free open source license, which is known as the GPL license, perhaps I should open that page up for you as well. Check this out. We would not have the revolution in computing and everything, AI, whatever you talk about, unless the GNU operating system had been built and the and the licenses under which it works. So if you want to know the licenses, please take a look at fsf.org. Please read up on GPL license and you will see what I mean. Do you know, I work very hard to bring uh, Creative Commons licensing to school books in India. Many of you here must have grown up becoming enlightened, better informed, even more knowledgeable, thanks to Wikipedia. I'm going to open Wikipedia for you and I'm going to show you the power of Wikipedia resides not just in its knowledge, but in the fact I'm going to open any random page here and you will see at the bottom of it, every page, so English, let's look for something on Wikipedia. Um, let's look for, let's say, I since I mentioned Rabindranath Tagore, okay. I'm reading the page on Rabindranath Tagore on Wikipedia. What makes it powerful? There's a photograph of Rabindranath Tagore. There are poems here, but please scroll down to the page. How many of you ever bothered to look at what's at the bottom here? Do you see this people? Text is available under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License. This is the power of design. Please take a look. Okay, I hope that kind of answers you. My job is to ignite your imagination, Srinivasan. Uh, please, please read on Creative Commons, connect with me over LinkedIn or something, share your findings. Share your findings under a CC license. Uh, KA, you're correct. Now, anonymous attending. The real problem is when the client and company says we need website done in one or two days. How can we tackle with this problem? <laughs> Good question. They don't give time to think. How can we solve the problem with design thinking and with using UX design process? When a client uh, wants a project done in one or two days. Let me fill this as a regression. 
If you were to build a product, a website for a client, hypothetically using design thinking and agile methods and something in one or two days, I triple guarantee you a client will come back and say, do it in 12 hours. Once you do it in 12 hours, I guarantee you the client will say, do it in six hours. And it's an infinite regress. Even if you manage to do that in three hours, they'll say, do it in one hour. So that is a skill which has nothing to do with how you can how you can do it. It's about how you manage your client and understand the depth and value that you're bringing in and how you convey that value to the client. And also in your desperation and understanding, do you want to take a project that's going to probably damage your health because you're going to work 24 hours without sleep and on caffeine and acidity and God knows what for three hours for a fistful of dollars. And is it worth the trouble and dedication and everything? So these are issues which are way beyond this discussion. But each one, of course, demands design thinking and how to handle it. I have actually pioneered and created systems of production workflows and design workflows where, where products and design, which would probably take two years or three years, I managed to pull through in three months or six months or even less. And I brought it down to that kind of speed. It works. It works brilliantly. I've been mentoring Karan Agarwal for quite some time. And he has just put together a team with a framework, he calls it, where he's been able to do the same for clients. And I'd like this opportunity to talk about his work as well, because I hope that very soon he publishes his work under a Creative Commons license as well, so that people in, in India can benefit from his approach to this. Okay, any other question, people? Uh, I guess uh, our time is up, uh, Neil. Yes. Uh, so, um, you know, thank you so much for this wonderful session. And may I request you to pick a winner for today? Uh, there is a one plus one. There's an anonymous attendee. There's Srinivasan here. Is it to do with quantity of questions or is it to do with quality of questions? I, I totally leave that to you. The qu quality is what we go for usually. Okay. So let me choose between one plus and anonymous and three. Uh, we do not define scope being the determining factor. Is culture and similar product of first? So anonymous uh, one plus uh, is a plus factor we send is the end user in the current chain of knowledge. So how do, how do we, uh, what was it? You know, I would love to announce Srinivasan as the winner today. Can you explain on Creative Commons? I think the, that's, that's fantastic. Somebody wants to understand the most powerful topic amongst all the topics being mentioned here today is Creative Commons. And the fact that India has been building wealth through centuries on Creative Commons, but how do we do that in the 21st century for the world? Srinivasan, you're the winner here. Thank you so much for that question. Enjoy the book. Congrats, Srinivasan. Uh, we will reach out to you with your gift and hope you all enjoyed this session. We will be sharing this uh, video recording with you uh, in a day or two. And I hope to see you all on our next webinar, which is on the 26th of March. Don't forget, you have the URL on your chat window to uh, register. And please come back for our next webinar. Thank you so much. And uh, good night, everyone. Sleep well. Neham, again, it's a big, big thank you to you. And I cannot tell you how much I've learned. And I'm quite, quite interested in this creative common language. It, it's, a, it's a new knowledge for me. So I'm going to dig deeper into it. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Namaste to all of you. Bye-bye.